Zortrax zigs instead of zags, token tactic triggers total puzzlement, Elagoo exhibits elegant resin wear but excludes essential PPE, and Forge showcases sleek systems silently supporting suspect software. All this and more, Printfix Friday, episode 196. Let's get into it. Starting off with one that I don't understand, and maybe some of you will be able to, but Zortrax, the maker of 3D printers, is apparently gonna have a crypto coin? I, I, I thought it was weird enough that we had politicians that were getting meme coins, but is this too much? Is, is this going too far? Some of you might not know Zortrax, and that might be for a reason. They have been kind of quiet lately, with I think one of their best printers being the M200. And while a plus version has been released, the M200 can date back nearly 10 years. While maybe some progress has been made, not exactly certain that they're staying on the forefront. We can see that recently they've gone the entire route of looking into bigger resin printers and Enderil which is a name, but they're claiming it to be an industrial 3D printer. And so as this industry has changed, they moved away from the more consumer grade focused machines or the, we'll call them small business focused machines, something that is more industrial focused. So if you haven't heard from them, it makes sense. This though, this absolute left field makes no sense to me. And I'd love to know from you all, why the heck would they do this? And looking at their white paper regarding the token itself, it does just kind of seem to be a fundraising tactic that people who want to support the brand can utilize these tokens to somehow gain favor with the team at Zortrax. It feels kind of like you're buying a seat at the table. To me, there is no way to fix this. The best way to handle companies that actively go down this crypto route is move on. If you never heard of this company, now you have, and you can go ahead and forget about them. I don't know why this in this industry, an industry that is not very pro crypto, not in my experience at least, look at the NFTs and how the 3D printing industry said, haha, you're non-fungible token, we can make it fungible enjoy crypto that doesn't have any intrinsic value to the person other than buying some sort of favor with the company feels a little bit rough to me i wish that zortrax would continue to try to innovate where they brought out a machine that was kind of the bamboo of its time while it was quite expensive back then the m200 did kind of set what we would compare other machines to as far as a standard uh, zero out of ten no notes Anyways, my name is Grant. This is Printfix Friday, where we help you get your 3D printers back to printing with purpose. And if you do enjoy our hot takes on the industry and you do want to keep your printers running well, make sure to leave a like and get subscribed. And if you are dealing with 3D printer issues and you do want to get some help, you can reach out to us on all the social medias. Heck, our favorite way is for you to make a YouTube video. Tag us in the description of that and we'll get a notification so we can go and watch it. Not only comment on your video to help you out there, but be able to work with you more one on one. If you are dealing with issues, please reach out to us. We would love to help you get your printers back up and running because nobody likes wasted time, especially Ford Motor Company. Let's take a watch. Super cool video, but then bamboo printers? More bamboo printers. Oh, there's some Mark Forge printers. Okay. Looks like we have some uh, Mark Forge Mark IIs on top. And I think those are X7s down below with an entire farm of bamboo 3D printers. For those that don't know, last I checked, Ford Motor Company is not just giving away their intellectual property. And uh, Bamboo Lab is not necessarily known for caring about customer intellectual property. We've covered this a few times. We'll link to it so you can take a look. This seems like potentially a bit of a misstep on Ford's part. Don't get me wrong. I love to see additive manufacturing used in manufacturing. In fact, Ford is one of the largest utilizers of additive manufacturing in the entirety of the United States. I believe there's only a couple of companies that are above them. And while that's incredible, you don't want to do that at the risk of your own intellectual property. Bought a 3D printer for $24.99.99. 
we saved $100,000 by replicating that one part across nine different lines. That is really the big thing here. Utilizing 3D printing to save money, right? You spent an investment of about $5,000 to save $100,000. I love that Ford is doing this. And I love they even made a video about it. I guess I'm frustrated as someone that cares so much about intellectual property to see Ford Motor Company just not caring. And you could say, Grant, they're using them offline. There's no intellectual property issues at all. Are you certain? Are you sure about that? Ford, if you or anyone that work for you are watching this, we recommend that you take your machines offline immediately and operate them in a fully air-gapped environment. While that does remove some of the benefits of the Bamboo Lab 3D printers, you don't want your competitors getting access to the kind of things that you are building. While there is no confirmed cases of this occurring currently, we can look to the history of Bamboo and the previous company where those engineers came from and see plenty of history that does exist. Be careful with your intellectual property, folks, especially when you're using cloud printing, because what is the cloud other than somebody else's computer? If they are maintaining these on a local area network or LAN, then there's certainly a bit more safety involved in it. However, if their machines that are doing the slicing are online, they are sending usage statistics back to Bamboo Lab. You know, assuming they're using Bamboo Studio or Orca Slicer, not in stealth mode. I feel like I have to beat this dead horse every now and then, and it frustrates me because companies like this should know better. Ford has so many great use cases for additive manufacturing, and I'm surprised that we don't see more of their high-end stuff. They've got a lot of powder nylon there as well. Is it cool to see that the lower-end machines are getting some love? Absolutely. But we now have this concern regarding intellectual property and the safety of that intellectual property, and that becomes a massive shareholder dilemma. Literally, Right in the background is an HP MJF 3D printer. So very clearly they have them. And yeah, there might be some tone differences to showing you a quarter million dollar powder nylon 3D printer, but it's there. Don't get me wrong. It's cool to see other machines, but come on guys. And so where exactly does this leave us? I think it is super, super, super cool. Ford is showing off what they're doing with 3D printing. I love it and I want more companies to do it. I don't like how we're seeing the integration of machines with known IP issues. And while Bamboo does make a good printer, in my opinion, it is not okay for an environment that utilizes NDAs, ITAR, or otherwise. Cases where if the data that you were printing got into the hands of somebody else, it would be a problem. And I believe in this case, it could be a problem. So my guess here is that Ford made this video to try to connect more with the average maker. At least for me, it's a bit rough. Love to know your thoughts down in those comments. I look at it from a couple of perspectives. From the hobbyist, super cool, absolutely love it, 10 out of 10. As a business owner, and technically as a shareholder for Ford as of recording this video, I have some concerns. Because if Ford is doing things on there that could constitute as intellectual property, there are some things that we might need to consider to at least secure those machines moving forward if they want to maintain them in their operation. Moving on to an actual print failure rather than more of a company failure, we've got support bridging issues help. They've got beautiful prints except for the underside of the supports. We can see here, yep, I would agree. Part looks very good, really clean. You got a nice little greenhouse going there, some beautiful plants in there. You can look at your support interface distance. So with support material, it will be building, building, building. Then it does a relatively dense layer, two, three, up to five in most cases. Then there's a gap. Then there's the part that goes on top of it. In Tool Changer 3D printers, we don't have to worry about the gap because we can just use dissimilar support. In machines that are stuck utilizing one material, you have to have a bit of a gap there so your supports don't weld to the actual part itself. If you have that gap too large, the underside of the supports don't look great. And while you could probably tune it a little bit, this is about as good as it tends to get. On a model like this flower pot guy, you could end up just cutting the arms off, printing them flat, gluing them on. You'd have significantly less issues to hide if you did it that way. The other option, which some of the commenters were talking about is, well, sand razor blades, torches, basic tools to make it look prettier. That doesn't solve the problem, it just hides the pain. 
You can see that it is a Ender 3 V3 SE. As far as my advice on this, go ahead, grab the X-Acto knife, clean it up, sand it down, and it will look pretty good. Otherwise, this part really is a tough one to support. You can look at decreasing that air gap. It might be at like 0.3, maybe it's 0.2. You can slowly inch up to it so that your support material doesn't fuse to the part itself, but still breaks away cleanly. You could also look at using organic supports or tree supports, depending on what slicer that you're using. And that can help on models like this. Or you could look at printing this at an angle where the arms themselves wouldn't need any support and you could support it in a different region. There are different ways around these problems. If you guys do want to see a video about us talking about how to avoid supports, how to design around supports, and if you're just downloading models, how to slice for supports, we'd love to do a video on that. Quite frankly, it'd probably be a bit of a series where we look at different machines having different types of blowers and different types of cooling on them. So if you wanna see that, let us know. I know supports can really depend on the model itself, depending on what printer it's on, how much cooling it has, everything like that. There are so many variables when it comes to supports. On average, reduce that Z distance between the support interface layers and your part. It should look better. You can also decrease your layer height. You'll end up with more layers and less of those overhangs that you see. Something to think about. Next up on reasons that Grant rants. We have Elegoo here showing us some things. Let's take a look. Decent technique. That's good. Put it in the wall. Oh, um... Resin is toxic, resin is toxic, resin is toxic, resin is toxic. I don't care if it was just in a wash unit. You can literally see the shine on this person's fingers as they're removing the support material. Your wash basin will be contaminated with raw resin. That means your part, unless you're doing multiple washes in multiple clean buckets of washing fluid, is going to have some level of surface contamination. The best way to do this is to make sure that you're wearing gloves. Please, resin is toxic. And while exposure to it is not going to send you into some allergy-induced shock, it can give you chemical burns if it's not dealt with in an appropriate amount of time. And the longer you are exposed to the resin, the fumes, things like that that come off of it, the higher chance that you have of developing a more serious allergy. And while sure, that does look pretty good, the gradient, spot on. The process to get there is what's concerning. The issue here is that so many people watch these videos and it's important for companies, content creators, and anybody that is filming themselves showing the process of producing a product, use the proper PPE. Even if you have decided internally that the risk of exposure is worth it to deal with the added dexterity, it is our duty and the duty of Elegoo, a company that sells resin printers and resin. We run into this where people will see this and go to copy it. And that's where we can get exposure to people that necessarily wouldn't have had it otherwise. It is important though that we maintain proper PPE and remember that resin is toxic. Gotta keep the editors on their feet. Scary feet, scary feet, scary feet. Oh. Resin is toxic. Last but not least, from the Cheaty Plus 4 Discord from user Valentin, who um has a spool on the inside of their printer. That's not where that belongs. You can't park there. Hey, you can't park there. You can't park there. There is no use case where this could actually happen. So I reached out to the user and said, how the actual heck did a spool end up on the inside of your printer? They said, well, this is a very soft TPU material and the reverse Bowden system that the Chidi has it's got a lot of friction on it, and it was easy for them to feed the filament directly into the extruder. Apparently, the roll wasn't unrolling properly, and when it had enough pressure, the extruder pulled the entire roll of filament into the printer. Hilariously, they caught this in time and was able to quickly remove the roll without hurting the print. No harm, no foul as far as I'm concerned, but that has to be one of the more hilarious things to see on a camera. You have this oh crap moment go through your head and then you post it and all of us are scratching our heads saying, 
That's not where that belongs. Chidi uses an external spooling system. You don't feed filament from inside the machine and it's a fully enclosed machine. How the heck does that get in there? The best way to solve this from ever happening again, especially when you're printing soft materials, is to use a reverse Bowden system. Now you don't have to use a long one like the plus four use, especially one that has so many bends in it. You can go out the top if you want, but have it go into a connector that is then attached to something else so that the effective extruder force is being pulled at that end of that Bowden tube or that other connector and not at the extruder itself. We can see just barely that the top of the extruder does not in fact, have a Bowden tube coming out of it. And that means that the pressure for where the machine is pulling is at the entrance to that extruder and not at the end of the Bowden tube. For our plus fours, we just run extra Bowden tube from the side of the machine out to the front of the shelves where we can feed filament in. It ensures the filament doesn't get tangled and that we can really stack the machines nice and close to each other to maximize the useful space that we have here in the shop. I'll be curious to see if people look at changing out the glass top for acrylic where you can drill a hole and put a Bowden tube connector to have a significantly smaller Bowden tube path. And while that might either completely eliminate or reduce the effectiveness of the filament tangle sensor that Chidi does have, which does work quite well. Thank you for that, Chidi. It has saved my bacon more than once. But I'll be curious to see if people bypass that to have a shorter path so that you can do more exotic materials and soft TPUs as we look at these chamber heated machines to be what we hope to be the future of 3D printing moving forward. Because, well, chamber heaters do make it easier to 3D print. And if you don't want to use it, like if you're printing PLA, don't turn it on. It makes life very easy. But I'd love to know your opinions down below. Have you experienced an issue like this before? And what are your thoughts on machines coming with chamber heaters? Or do you think that it's not worth that added expense to eat in the manufacturing and it's easier just to offer an upgrade. And if you are the type of person that likes to hack the Gibson and wants to come hang out in our private Discord server, you can join the $10 tier and higher and join the names listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher that support the channel and make videos like these possible. As we come up to 200 episodes and technically 208 is going to be the four year mark, but you know, we're going to celebrate something at the 200. We'd love to know your thoughts as what you'd like to see. Should we have one where we make fun of people or should we look at trying out something different for Print Fix Friday? love to know your thoughts. That is all we have for you all today. Don't forget to leave a like and get subscribed. And hey, if you're feeling zesty and want to pick up a Victoria shirt, you can do so. Links down in that description. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome.